Thank you very much. Uh, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. And we Thank can you very much well. for your kind invitation and for your introduction. And I wanted to congratulate the organizers for uh, having put on the map this very important um, um, introduction into science. Uh, what I want to do today is uh, to uh, talk about targeted therapies for primary immune deficiency diseases to lead the way into our modern medicine, which has developed over thousands of years. And I just wanted to show you, um, let's see here, we need to go here. Excellent. I wanted to lead you back to a very important person. Uh, that was Hippocrates, who was around uh, in the world for 2,500 years ago. He is the person who really made medicine from a mysterious, uh, suspicion-driven uh, entity uh, to a science-driven or observation-driven uh, entity. Uh, he observed patients based on taking very careful medical histories, family histories, and could now identify diseases like diabetes. He talked about cancer, epilepsy. Uh, he studied uh, in patients, he studied plant-based medicine. That was all that was available. He taught medicine to his students and established essentially a medical school in Greece. And most importantly, he recognized that the doctors, the medicine specialists have power and could harm patients. So he created this idea of first do not harm. And that's what this, uh, this uh, rule is written here in, on a papyrus 2,400 years ago. And importantly, he recorded his knowledge and gave it on to the next generation. So if you now move into medieval science-driven or non-science-driven therapies, these uh, therapies were based on observation, but they're not scientifically vigorous. Uh, they were the medicine treatments were carried out by barbers and surgeons, so-called surgeons who were able to set broken bones, uh, but, but they made serendipitous discoveries for instance, uh, they found out that if you use digitalis in patients who had dropsy or edema, about half of the patient would respond very nicely. The other half would not, but they couldn't differentiate between uh, an edema caused by uh, cardiovascular uh, um, problems or by a renal insufficiency. They also noticed that fresh citrus and food prevented scurvy, which was very important for the sailors who were on sailboats for weeks traveling on the oceans. They also in Bavaria observed that if you uh, had patients who were chlorotic, they were essentially anemic. If you took nails and put them in an apple in the evening, and then the next morning took the, the nails out uh, and ate the apple, you could cure anemia. But they were not quite clear why this happened. For skin lesions, no, they used uh, 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 alcohol to, to, to uh, um, kill bacteria, but this was before microbes were actually uh, uh, recognized. And then they had, uh, in many places in the Western world, they did bloodletting for everything. And that, of course, most of the time did not work. Some patients probably were killed by that. Now, in the 20th century, we started uh, to use science-driven therapies based on chemical analysis. For instance, uh, if one could demonstrate that compounds, if they were missing, caused specific diseases, one could take, one could isolate these compounds and give it, for instance, vitamin C could be isolated from, from uh, plants and uh, uh, one could cure vitamin deficiency like scurvy or uh, pernicious anemia. They realized that it was caused by lack of B12. So 
you isolated B12 from liver, for instance, and could treat pernicious anemia. Iron deficiency, they didn't need apples uh, that were treated with nails. Now you could give uh, iron salt. Vitamin D prevents rickets. Insulin could correct diabetes mellitus. So now we had some sort of disease-specific therapies. But then in the 21st century, the last 20, 30 years, the, uh, the science-driven therapy was based on gene analysis. And that's what I wanted to point out today. Just as an example, transcobalamin was recognized as a autosomal recessive disorder caused by lack of this protein, which was, which was imminently needed for the transfer of B12 from the GI tract to the hematopoietic system. And one could now bypass this, this lack of transcobalamin by just giving large doses of B12, not by mouth, but by injection, which cured uh, B12 deficient uh, pernicious anemia. So uh, what I wanted to now focus on this type of treatment, gene-specific treatment, on example of primary immune deficiencies, or PID. Those, these are molecularly defined diseases. Uh, we now know over 400 unique genes that are important for either adaptive immunity, which are T and B cells, or innate immunity, which consists of complement, phagocytes, no, the T and B cells, of course, because it's called adaptive, they, are, they can be educated through immunizations, for instance, uh, whereas innate is uh, not educatable. These patients present with infections. That's why they are PIDs. But they also have autoimmunity, malignancies, and some of them have these granulomatous infiltrates, which uh, the uh, speaker before me pointed out as sarcoidosis. And that is probably has a connection between uh, the sarcoidosis and the granulomatous infiltrates in the lungs of patients with uh, these type of PIDs. The, uh, by knowing the genes, we can now look for gene-specific treatment. For instance, if a patient has mutations that prevents the production of adenosine deaminase, a, a, a enzyme that is very important for T cell development. That can now be replaced if it's not there. Uh, one, one can synthesize ADA and pegulate it and give it as shots once a week and the immune system remarkably recovers with this uh, substitution of the, the missing enzyme. And I, if I have time, I will talk to you a little bit about signaling pathways due to stats, for instance. There are mutations, gain-of-function mutations, which uh, cause immune deficiency, and one can select kinase inhibitors to influence this uh, signaling pathway. So this is just a, a, a review of the immune system. You have the adaptive immunity on the right side with T and T cells. On the left side, the in, uh, innate immunity with complement, phagocytes, and the, these um, parts of the immune system are very influential in the host defense. If there is, are mutations, deficiencies, the, the, the host gets infections, autoimmune disease, malignancies, and these, these um, uh, compartments, they work together. So it's not that they, they are independent uh, systems, they are integrated in the host defense system. Now let's go back to the end of the 19th century. This is Emil von Behring. You can see him in his lab with guinea pigs and some material. He has an assistant. And he figured out that you could immunize animals like rabbits with tetanus toxin or diphtheria toxin, either in low doses or to as toxoid. And then these animals became resistant to the toxins. They, uh, they would, there's something in the blood or in the serum or in the extravascular fluid that destroyed, neutralized these toxins. Uh, and he realized that this effect when you actively immunize these animal, uh, animals is lasting throughout the life of the animals. And it can be transferred by blood 
or serum to other animals of the same species. But that transfer was passive and it only lasted about a month or two. And based on this knowledge, sparing serum therapy became a very important part of medicine in uh, the early part of the 20th century. It was used successfully in Europe, the United States, to prevent tetanus and diphtheria complications due to passive immunity. So they would use the serum from an immunized horse or a cow or a goat or a pig and gave this to a patient who had just started developing diphtheria or who had uh, injuries that would make them susceptible to tetanus. Uh, they, they noticed, however, if they gave horse serum twice, then the uh, patient would develop anaphylaxis to the horse serum. So you had to very carefully uh, decide what serum you would give. And it was, when I was a, a resident and intern, we first used horse serum, then if there was another uh, episode, you used cow and, cow and then goat and then pig serum. The solution came if we learned how to actively immunize children, for instance, against diphtheria or against tetanus, and we did not have this problem with anaphylaxis anymore. I wanted to point out a very interesting character here, which is Paul Ehrlich, who worked with Bering uh, he was an ingenious uh, character. Uh, for instance, he learned, he, he designed the, uh, the staining of uh, anatomical preparation for microscopy using the newly developed alanine uh, um, uh, colors. And all what we do now by, by staining tissue with, with colors, that came back to him when he did his uh, doctoral thesis. But he also uh, developed the idea of what he called side chain therapy. So he said, in order to make these antibodies, you have to have cells that have receptors for the antigen. You see here, this, this uh, binds here. Then when that antigen binds, there will be more of these antigen specific products, these receptors, which are actually B cell receptors in, in, in modern uh, terminology, they would develop more and more and then more of these antigens will bind. And now that cell, which now now is a B cell or a plasma cell, will produce these, these uh, antigen receptors on B cells, release it, and these will be the antibodies. He got the Nobel Prize for this discovery. And that is what he, uh, uh, was uh, hypothesizing that these things would exist. And here is an IgG molecule where you see the antigen binding site, very specific for an antigen. But there are also other areas like the FC uh, end of this uh, molecule where it binds to FC receptors, which makes this very much more effective, also prevents that the IgG molecule is metabolized and disappears like other molecules like insulin, which you have to give every day. The IgG hangs around for a month or six weeks. And therefore, when we, if we use IVIG, we only have to do it once a month. So let's look at the adaptive immunity where we have a B cell, a B -cell defect. So if you have no B cells, you have no antibodies and you can substitute this with IVIG or with specific monoclonal antibodies. And that is effective in antibody deficient patients. So the first one who identified a, a patient who cannot make antibodies and had the idea to use these uh, immunoglobulin preparations was Putin. In 1953, he had a patient which subsequently was diagnosed as X-linked A-gamma globulinemia. He couldn't make antibodies. So he thought, well, there is this new product, corn fraction two. He gave it to this patient subcutaneously in decent doses. And to everybody's surprise, this patient no longer had infections. And before that, he had every month, he had pneumonia. So IgG replacement therapy is used mainly in antibody deficient patients. It's derived from plasma. It's not a cure, but it's life-saving. 
and one gives it ASO once a month, as I pointed out, because IgG has a long half-life, ASO IV, or you give smaller doses subcutaneously once a week. But also, we can now engineer specific monoclonal antibodies. So we are no longer uh, completely dependent on human plasma. And one example is anti-respiratory syncytial virus uh, monoclonal antibody. It's called Synagis. This is being given to preemies, to newborns in the RSV season, very effective in, in, in preventing serious complications with RSV. And as one of, some of you may know, the president of the United States received a monoclonal antibody, actually a mixture of two monoclonal antibodies against SARS-2, uh, which is generated from Regeneron. Very effective, we have used it in two severely immune deficient patients who just sailed through their COVID-19 COVID disease, um, but probably based on treatment with these specific monoclonal antibodies. Now, if we hypothesize a disease that eliminates the, entirely the adaptive immunity, those patients have no B cells, they have no T cells and are now uh, considered as severe combined immune deficiency or SCID, they do not respond very well to, an, to antibodies to IVIG. They need also T cells. And the only way to cure them is with hemat hematopoietic stem cell transplantations, HSCT, or gene therapy, which is very specific then for one single gene. So these SCID patients, uh, they... Uh, severe combined immune deficiency. They present with lymphopenia. They have at birth low tracks, which are T cell receptor excision circles, which essentially tell you that the thymus produces T cells. They have a small thymus. The disease has early onset, severe with any type of, of infections, microbes you can think of. They get systemic infections and usually die of it. They get diarrhea, failure to thrive rashes and usually die in spite of giving them IVIG and antibiotics, they die during the first two years of life. This is one of those skid patients born in the 1960s when we still used smallpox vaccine, a live vaccine, and you can see he had generalized uh, um, varicella infection and these patients all died in spite of giving them um, um, IVIG. They need something else. So this, this is indeed a medical emergency. And what can we do? We need to make a diagnosis early before they get infectious. So now in many countries, we do newborn screening using the TRAC system. They get temporarily IVIG, subcutaneous immunoglobulin, prophylactic antibiotics, antivirals, pneumocystis prophylaxis and no live vaccines like for instance BCG, but that holds them only for a little while. Then, because that is not enough, you need to submit these patients to hematopoietic stem cell transplantation or to gene therapy to some of these patients where it has been uh, successfully carried out. So this skit or Severe combined or combined immune deficiency gene specific therapy is based on, first of all, identifying the gene defect precisely. Then one takes a cDNA of this gene, let's say the common gamma chain, puts on a promoter and packages this into a viral vector, either a retroviral vector or a lentiviral vector, which now allows the entrance of this specific cDNA to integrate into the DNA of hematopoietic stem cells. So one takes hematopoietic stem cells, introduces this cDNA, and re-injects the hematopoietic stem cells into the patient. And it has been shown successfully, uh, a successful treatment in X-linked skid due to IL-2 receptor deficiency, in adenosine deaminase deficiency, Artemis, and in viscous Aldrich syndrome. So there are two problems. One, there could be only a partial correction if not enough hematopoietic stem cells got the gene inserted. The other, which is, can be lethal, 
is if that cDNA integrates into the wrong place in the front of an oncogen. And now with a strong promoter induces the oncogen, which results in leukemia. And that has been found in or observed in patients with X-linked skid and viscoid Aldrich syndrome. And you have to find the right retroviral uh, vector to prevent this uh, uh, terrible co uh, complication. So at the end, I just wanted to introduce you to a group of PIDs uh, which are unique due to gain of function. Most of these PIDs have a loss of function, but these have a gain of function mutations in kinase pathway um, uh, genes. The, the clinical phenotype, of course, is P like PID with frequent infections, but they usually have severe autoimmune disease and very often malignancies. The genes that can do this, where, the, uh, where these gain of function mutations occur are stats like STAT1, STAT3, PI3 kinase delta, which is a kinase, CARD11. And uh, the, the options we have in addition to IVIG antimicrobials are products, are, are drugs that interfere, that inhibits these pathways, like for instance, the mTOR, mTOR pathway. Uh, we use sirolimus, very effective. The STAT signaling pathways can be inhibited with anti-IL-6 or anti-IL-6 receptor. There is one of those drugs that have been around for a while. Kinase inhibitors uh, like JAK1, JAK3, and these are products that have been available for several years, not to treat these gain of function mutations, but to treat malignancies, and they were on the shelf, so they would be were available to treat these patients very successful. And of course, to cure these patients, you need again to use hematopoietic stem cell transplantation. And this is my last slide, just to uh, introduce to you the um, concept of cytokine receptors. Uh, when a cytokine like IL-2, for instance, binds to the receptors, now kinases, which are closely linked to these receptors, like JAK1 and JAK3, are phosphorylated, are activated. And these, these kinases will now phosphorylate the stats, which are transcription factors. If they are phosphorylated, they now remove, get, get into the cytoplasm and are able as thymus to to enter the nucleus, the nuclear membrane, and find a spot on the DNA as transcription factors to induce um, cytokines, for instance, like up here, which, which are driving the immune system uh, to overactivity. And when we use these kinase inhibitors here, in these uh, the specific, we will interfere with this hyperactivation and essentially uh, calm down the overactive immune system. This brings me to the end. I, I want to uh, thank again the, the, the organizers and point out uh, that uh, Seattle is a wonderful city. Uh, that is our university, the campus in spring with all the flowers, uh, cherry flowers and the students. This was last year hanging out. Uh, if you go through uh, our university now, it's pretty empty because of the COVID-19. Thank you very much.